Today we're covering Medicare Basics 101 for the annual enrollment period. We're going to cover Part A and B. So hopefully um, we have you know some people on here that might be new to it or maybe just want a little refresher just to kind of go over some of the basics. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in the chat and I'll try and address them at the end of the presentation. All right, let's go ahead and kick this off. So to kind of go over our family tree, I went over this last week as well. Um, I've been with VelaPoint National General AHCP for about three years, um, covering multiple different areas in the company. And to kind of look at the tree here, we have National General as our parent tree. And then we have uh, VelaPoint, which is a call center for insurance agents that sell insurance all over the U.S. Soon after acquiring um, National General, acquiring VelaPoint, they acquired HCP as well, which is the broker side of things. And then with that, they had also acquired NHIC, which is now National General Accident and Health. They've combined NHIC as well as formerly Assurant TIC supplement products. And then soon after that, they had acquired Health Compare Solutions Team, HST. And recently, uh, we have in this year acquired Health Compare. Health Compare is more of the Medicare side of things. So it really helps us boost up more of the over 65 uh, carriers that we can extend out. And then with that came along Quote-It. And just in the last couple months, we've acquired Agent Cube, the smart CRM. So kind of to you know, go over some of the agenda of what is Medicare, why sell Medicare, enrollment period, your AEP, your part A and B, coverage and exclusions, different ways to get Medicare, Medicare premiums and cost sharing. So what is Medicare? Medicare is a government health insurance program created for people ages 65 or older. People under age 65 with certain disabilities, maybe they're on Social Security for the last couple of years, they would qualify. People with, um, of you know, all ages with end-stage renal disease. And CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, regulates the Medicare program. Um, as well as, you know, med helps with the Medicare beneficiaries and health uh, carriers who offer various forms of Medicare health coverage. CMS guidelines, it just ensures that Medicare beneficiaries are provided with accurate information. And then the carriers um, only, con only contract with agents who are properly licensed to sell health insurance products in the state in which they sell and market. So kind of just a brief overview on that. Um, CMS, you know, definitely helps out uh, tremendously when it comes to Medicare. So kind of jumping in, um, I covered this last week, so I'm not going to go real in depth on some of the numbers. But, you know, to really go into this, look at this, you know, the chart here, you have a population age 65 and over for the United States from the year 2012, which is just a, you know five years ago, to 2050, and it about doubles. Um, so that's a tremendous growth. About you know every eight seconds, a person ages into Medicare, and you know all these baby boomers, you know by by the year 2050 will be about the age of 85. And when I looked at these, um, you know, some of the different stats and, and pulling some numbers from census.gov, um, they had estimated right now that there's about 50 million 700 um, and 80 something population right now in regards to qualifying for Medicare. So that's fantastic. These are over 65 population. Um, you have a lot of people who will be switching you know, one out of four um, Medicare Advantage customers will change plans every year. So there's a lot of opportunities there for population, as well as, you know, when they switch plans, you get to um, assist and help out with that. You know, some common factors for switching um, could be cost factors or their premiums and pharmacy co-pays, those sorts of things. Um, you know, maybe the market exits, we've seen that with the under 65 with some of the carriers. So, you know, definitely there's, um, there's, you know, that factor, as well as you have people who, um, in regards to, you know, joining, you have new retirees, um, estimated about 
two to, I think it's about 2.3 million will be leaving their group plans. So they'll be you know, able to jump in on the Medicare um, uh, side of plans there. So kind of just looking at Medicare, you have a hospital insurance, medical insurance, you have Medicare plan advantage, um, you know, Medicare advantage plans, as well as prescription drug plans. So you're, you have two enrollment periods that, you know, we're kind of looking at generally right now. You have your annual enrollment period, which is October 15th and ends on December 7th. And then all of your plans uh, coverage starts on January 1st of those new plans. And then you have your general enrollment period. Um, you know, if they don't sign up with Part A or Part B during the initial enrollment period when they first become eligible, they can sign up for general enrollment period um, generally between January 1st and March 31st. Um, and then their plan coverage would start July 1st. So just kind of looking at your annual enrollment period, um, you know, starting October 15th, you do have that pre-annual enrollment period that is October 1st to the 14th, and that's kind of your prep. That's where you get to go through, um, you know, reach out to your clients, see if they've had their flu shots, you know, uh, double check with them, see how they're doing, um, maybe new, if they have any new prescriptions, um, you know, and those sorts of things, double check to make sure that they're, if their care physician is within their network, you can kind of prep. The one thing that you have to make sure that you do not do is you cannot collect or hold um, those pre-AEP applications. Applications, if it's a paper applicant, it must, um, application, it must stay with that applicant. And agents cannot solicit applicants to mail in their enrollment applications prior to that annual election period. So, you know, you can kind of do that prep work from the 1st to the 14th, but definitely cannot get those signed and sent in. As soon as that October 15th date hits, the applicant can sign and date and submit that form. So there are some carriers that still do use um, paper applications only. So, you know, you just have to kind of uh, make sure that what you know plan is within the area that you're selling and see if it's a digital application or paper application that has to be sent in or faxed in. So you have your four pieces here divided into four parts um, for Medicare. You have part A, which is your um, in-hospital insurance, it's inpatient. And then you have your part B, which is medical insurance, your outpatient services and supplies. You have part C, um, kind of referred to as that uh, original Medicare. It's a Medicare Advantage. It allows people to receive all of their health care services through that private insurance company. And then you have Part D. Um, Part D covers, you know, that prescription drug coverage. Today we're going to go over the A and B plans. So I kind of jump into what is Part A. Well, Part A is hospital insurance. As I said, it's for inpatient. So Medicare Part A helps put, pay for inpatient hospital care, inpatient care in a skilled nursing facility, home health care, and hospice care. Uh, you automatically get enrolled if you qualify when turning 65, and it starts. As, um, it will start on that first of your birthday month unless you are born on the first day of the month. If so, then it'll start on the month before. Otherwise, it's on the first day of your 25th month. Um, otherwise, it can also be the first day of the 25th month of Social Security disability income as well. So it's not just for when you turn 65. It's also for when um, those beneficiaries, you know, have had Social Security disability for those 25 months. Part A coverage renews automatically from year to year, and customers don't have to do anything. So monthly Medicare Part A premiums. Um, most individuals get Part A coverage without having to pay Part A premium. This is because either they or their spouse paid Medicare taxes while they worked for a specified duration of time. It's 40 credits or uh, equivalent to 10 years. And for those individuals who did not automatically qualify for those premium free Part A coverages, the monthly Part A premium in 2017 is up to $413, depending on the individual's duration of Medicare covered employment. So just kind of a reminder, Part A, usually um, not likely to have charges. So, you know, kind of uh, makes it, you know, useful. If they partially qualify, um, 
It also, you know, could be if they worked about say 30 to 39 quarters, it would be about $227 for their premiums. So again, it really kind of depends on that individual's duration. So to jump into kind of their benefit period, um, <clears throat> Part A deductible is uh, 1,316 in 2017. They haven't released the deductibles for the upcoming 2018. Um, so as soon as that is released, we'll definitely get the information updated. But benefit period begins on the day that you first receive inpatient care in the hospital or a skilled nursing facility. The Medicare Part A deductible covers beneficiaries costs up to 60 days of Medicare covered inpatient hospital care in a benefit period. The beneficiaries must pay $329 per day for uh, day 61 through 90 in 2017. So if you're in the hospital, say 75 days, you will pay that $313 or $1,316 deductible. And then for each day, 61 through 75, there is a fee of $329 per day. And then $658 for the day of the hospital stay beyond 90 days. Um, so it would be starting on the 91st day at that point. And you pay the cost for each day for the lifetime reserve. The beneficiaries in a skilled nursing facility and the daily co-insurance for days 21 through 100 in the benefit period um, will be about 164.50 in 2017. As I said, these numbers will um, likely change once they get those posted. So, you know, it's extremely important to explain the benefits in a language that, you know, the average person may not understand. So when you're speaking with your beneficiaries, make sure that they can kind of understand all the costs in these benefit periods. Um, you know, for your skilled nursing facilities, again, as I said, we don't want to use the word free, but we want to say little to no cost. Um, with Medicare, it's very specific on certain words that you use or don't use. So we can't overextend what we say. Um, so you want to say little to no cost for the first 20 days in a benefit period. 164.50 for those days, 21 to 100 for each benefit period, and all costs for each days after 100 uh, days in the benefit period. So that customer is going to endure all the costs after each day after that 100, 100 day, you know, in the benefit period. So definitely, you know, to kind of go through and look at, um, I have a personal story myself to kind of, you know, break down the scenario. My father-in-law, um, he was hurt extremely badly in a work-related injury years ago. And with that, he ended up having metal rods and a knee replacement running up and down through his knee and leg. And last year, he ended up getting a really severe staph infection. And with that, staph infections, um, they attack metal. Uh, staph will immediately attack it, and it can become very, very life-threatening. They had to keep him in quarantine. He was in the hospital for almost um, like seven months, eight months of the year. It was definitely uh, pretty intense between the hospital as well as a nursing facility to help him out. So initially, you know, he was in there from February to April for the hospital. So he had that $1,300 and 16 um, deductible that he had to pay. He also went over that 60 days in the hospital. So in that case, you know, he had that $329 you know, per day times that $30, which came to $9,870 um, in that hospital. So again, I said it's zero to, you know, um, zero dollars in that first one to 20 days. So fortunately, that kind of helped him out. But then after that, he had, you know, that 164.50 times, and he was in for about, you know, 80 days. So then, you know, after that, he was in for, I am not sure how many, I can't exactly remember how many days precisely, but anything after that 100 days, he had to pay out of pocket. You know, if we break it all down, he really, out of pocket wise, had to cover about $24,000 out of his own pocket that was not covered for, you know, his care. Fortunately, he did have coverage, um, but that's still a large chunk that he had to pay out of his own pocket because of the of severe you know, staff infection that, as I said, put him in the hospital for several, several months as well as a nursing facility. So 
you know, it's definitely one of those things he had to, you know, be thankful that he at least had the coverage um, because it really, really could have been much, much worse for him. So what is, you know, covered in Part A? Um, you know, there's several different things that can be covered in Part A. You have a semi-private room, which from my understanding um, with HIPAA and everything else, they're going to now um, change a few of those rules and regulations. Um, and then your hospital meals, those are covered, your skilled nursing services, your lab tests, your x-rays, radiation treatments, um, as long as you're inpatient at the time. So if you go in for an x-ray, you need to make sure that you're actually checked into the hospital for that x-ray to occur. Some blood transfusions um, in the hospital or a skilled nursing facility, um, you know, just certain things, uh, care to, you know, manage your symptoms or control that pain um, if they're terminally ill. So that would be, you know, kind of falling under that um, if they had hospice care. You know, some of the things that aren't covered, um, you know, are things, like I said, if it doesn't apply to that in hospital coverage. Um, so you gotta be kind of careful that they are actually checked into the hospital for this um, to have that coverage actually apply and, and protect them. Coverage and cost sharing amounts. Um, you have inpatient hospital care, skilled nursing care, and then you also have home health care and hospice care. Hospital insurance helps pay up to um, 90 days in that net network hospital in any benefit period subject to a deductible. The first 60 days are covered at that 100% approved um, charges after the deductible is met. So they have to make sure that they meet that deductible first. Then the next 30 days covered and um, next 30 day covered, you know, are paid, but they are paid with a daily co-payment. Every Part A insured has a lifetime reserve of 60 days of hospital care. A lifetime reserve um, days have a co-payment that is twice that of the days 61 throughout 90, and they are non-renewable. So covered services include semi-private rooms, those meals and regular nursing um, services, um, lab tests, x-rays, those things that we had talked about. Blood is also covered um, except for the first three pints. So we got to, you know, <laughs> they end up needing a blood transfusion, anything beyond three points, or uh, they have they will be able to receive anything beyond that uh, three pints. So it'll um, definitely help in that area. Under the inpatient hospital stay, Part A does not include a private duty nurse, a television or telephone in their room. It also does not include a private room unless medically necessary. So unlike my father-in-law's case, he was um, with staff. Staff is highly contagious, so he had to be put into his own private room due to that. So his was definitely one of those situations where he had to have that. Your skilled nursing facility, Part A, helps pay for up to 100 days in participating skilled nursing facilities in each benefit period. Um, and we kind of talked about the costs of that uh, previously. So, you know, and those covered expenses will include, you know, meals, regular nurses, um, nursing and rehabilitation services, as well as some other supplies. And home health care, um, for an individual who's confined to home and meeting certain other conditions, hospital insurance can pay the full amount um, approved, you know, for home health visits from participating home health agencies. There's no limit to the number of covered visits. Uh, covered services include part-time skilled nursing, uh, physical therapy, and speech therapy. Hospital insurance also covers part-time services of home health aides, occupational therapy, medical, social services. And then you have hospice care. Under certain conditions, hospital insurance can help pay for hospice care for terminally um, ill insureds if that care is provided by a Medicare certified hospice. So covered services include doctor services, um, nursing services, medical appliances, um, as well as some therapies, medical social services, uh, short-term inpatient care, including respite care and counseling. To kind of briefly go over what Part B is, um, you know, to kind of look at it, automatically enrolled when you get Part A. Um, it is optional to take, though. Um, in most cases, it depends on whether they're getting Social Security benefits. 
So that, you know, is definitely one of those things to consider. Medicare Part B helps pay for doctor visits, outpatient services, durable medical equipment, such as like um, a wheelchair or oxygen tank, something in that regard. X-rays, lab tests, ambulance services. So Part B is offered um, to everyone who gets Part A, and it is optional to take, as I said. Most people enroll in Medicare Part B pay the standard monthly premium. However, if the insured modified adjusted gross income reports on um, an IRS tax return is above that certain amount, the insured may be required to pay a little bit higher premium. So definitely um, kind of depends on where they fall in that bracket for their tax return um, or their gross income. I should say, sorry. And then Medicare Part B pays for doctor services and variety of other medical services and supplies not covered by the hospital insurance. Uh, most of the services needed with people with perma you know, permanent kidney failure are covered by only medical insurance. So, you know, as I said, um, it is optional, but it is offered to everyone who enrolls in Part A. And as I said, usually it is depending on if they're getting Social Security benefits. Change it, the uh, premiums for Part B do change from year to year. In 2018, uh, Medicare will issue a new base premium of rate. It's not available yet. Um, you know, it's going to also depend on their income. Um, at this point in time, for the 2017 individuals with income over 85,000 or following filing jointly with income over 170,000 pay more. So if they're on a higher gross income, they definitely will have a higher premium. And it'll, um, right now it's about up to two, or I'm sorry, 428. Um, you know, that was 2016 based income related monthly adjusted amount. So that will change. And most people who get social security benefits pay less, $134. Now they do have that option to get that um, set up and auto deducted from their social security. If they do that, it automatically will drop that premium down to $109 on average. So, you know, it definitely make sure that uh, you double check with them if they plan on having it auto deducted. And just to kind of give you generalized, um, you know, income grid and what it would look like for them and what their premiums would look like depending on their income. So again, you know, that eight, under 85,000 um, or if they're filing joint, you know, at 170,000, the 217 Part B premium, about $134. Now, if we jump all the way down and they're really, you know, have a much higher income, 214,000 um, individual or 428,000 as a joint return, their premiums would go up to about $428.60. So if you're familiar with the under 65 major medicals, you know, you kind of understand some of these with the premiums um, being different costs for different income levels. Part B has an annual deductible of $183 um, for 2017. Deductibles for 2018 um, have yet to be released again, um, as I said, um, but the carriers will you know, hopefully release those soon. It's usually once we're a little bit closer, being that we have a month and a half to go, uh, or almost two months to go. Um, and it usually will change from year to year. Um, usually. And after that annual medical insurance deductible is met, medical insurance generally pays for about 80% of the approved charges for covered expenses for the remainder of the year. There's no maximum out-of-pocket limit on the 20% coinsurance. So there's no uh, kind of, I guess, like stop loss for that coinsurance. So it can keep going um, continuously every single time that they're seen. Um, and then it covers medically necessary services. Again, um, you know, it's for the outpatient doctor visits, outpatient services, uh, those durable medical equipment, you know, like I said, um, you know, maybe a motorized wheelchair or a regular wheelchair or crutches or oxygen tank, those things, x-rays, lab tests. And then they must keep part A and B in order to get that, um, have a Vantage Plan or Medigap. So in order to get that Medigap, they have to have A and B. That's important. That'll come back up again um, in another training that we're going to do. So definitely uh, make sure that you pay attention to that. 
um, and make sure that you kind of go over that. Um, just so you know, original Medicare has this big deductible per benefit period. So high co-pays for insurance, or uh, I'm sorry, for hospital per day and skilled nurses. Um, part B is just 80-20. So a 20% uh, bill of like 30,000 surgery will add up, um, but there's no out-of-pocket limits. So make sure that you're paying attention to that for your customer, that they're aware that um, there's no stop loss on that. Customers that didn't sign up with Part B when they were first eligible, uh, they do and can endure a 10% penalty for each full 12-month period um, they were eligible and didn't sign up. Now, if they go ahead and get signed up with Part B, um, somewhere before that 12th month, 11 month or fewer, there's no penalty. So that definitely helps out tremendously in that regard. Um, and usually there's not a penalty if they sign up during that special enrollment period, which we will cover in another training um, at another time with the special enrollment periods. Um, their payments, how they pay, they can have it automatically deducted with Social Security. And as I said, it will drop down to $109 if they do that. Automatic deduction, um, if they're a railroad retirement um, person, they you know can have it deducted from their pension check. Same with if they're a federal government, um, they can you know person who has a pension, they can have that auto deducted. They can receive quarterly bills um, and do payments that way, you know, or they can have it easily deducted from their bank account. Some of the cost share and coverage um, in this regard, you know, the, they have to have and make sure that that deductible is met. They have doctor services, outpatient hospital services, home health visits, um, other medical and health services, prescription drugs, um, usually have a little bit more limited coverage. Um, outpatient treatment for mental illness and wellness. So for doctor services, you know, Part B will cover doctor services no matter where received in the United States. Covered doctor services includes surgical services, diagnostic tests, um, you know, those um, medical supplies furnished in a doctor's office. Outpatient hospital services, Part B covers outpatient hospital services um, for diagno diagnosis and treatment, such as care in an uh, emergency room or an outpatient clinic. Um, home health visits, Medicare will pay for you know, home health services as long as these services are recommended by the insured doctors and, insured is, and the insured is eligible. Um, and then you have some other medical and health services, you know, under certain conditions and limitations, medical insurance covers other medical services and supplies. Um, so like ambulance transportation in that regard, or, um, you know, having those lab tests, oral surgery, outpatient physical therapy, those are t um, items. And then your uh, prescription drugs, um, there's definitely some limited coverage on there. Only medicines that are administered in the hospital outpatient department under certain circumstances, such as injectable um, drugs um, at the doctor's office or some oral cancer drugs or drugs that are required dur you know, for durable medical equipment um, like nebulizers or infusion pumps. Those are covered. And other examples, um, you know, are, you know, insured under Part B will have to pay 100% for most prescription drugs unless they are covered by uh, Part D. So if they go ahead and get set up with Part D, then it's going to help with that. Outpatient treatments of mental illness. Um, Medicare covers outpatient treatment for approved conditions such as depression and anxiety in a doctor's office or other health care provider's office or hospital out, um, outpatient department. So generally, em enrollees will pay 20% of that Medicare approved amount, um, which is their coinsurance. Part B deductible also applies. And note that inpatient mental health care is covered under Part A as well. So, you know, definitely um, a few different things that they will help with your cost sharing and coverage for different services. And to kind of look at the grid of, you know, what Medicare pays and what um, the customer pay or yourself if you're, you know, eligible. Um, I've come across, you know, a few different agents that say I'm, you know, I'm eligible as well. So, 
you know, you just need to kind of out, take an outline of some of the different things. Um, for instance, the laboratory services, um, medical, you know, for a medical expense, it's unlimited if medically necessary. Medicare generally pays about 100% of the approved amount, so that beneficiary would pay nothing for the services. Now, in regards to, um, say, outpatient hospital treatment, the benefit is there's an unlimited amount of, you know, if it's medically necessary. Medicare, um, Medicare payments to the hospital based on the hospital costs. So it does depend on the hospital cost if they're going to go to an extremely expensive hospital. But that customer um, or beneficiary pays 20% of the billed amount after the deductible is met. So they need to make, you know, make that deductible and then um, they'll have about 20% of the bill that uh, responsibility. So definitely, you know, it definitely helps out in regards to that uh, covered service. Some of the exclusions um, that are not covered under Part B um, kind of is a lot of the different things that you see um, that Part A would cover. So you have, you know, your uh, private duty nurses, they do not cover those. It's um, important to remember it does not cover dental coverage or eyeglasses, uh, vision, those sorts of things, unless it results from an accident only. So that's you know something to keep in mind. Hearing aids, orthopedic shoes, um, expenses incurred during um, or incurred due to a war or act of war. That's also um, important to you know pay attention to. What's not covered? Um, a little bit of example here, long-term care. We all know that long-term care is not covered by Medicare. Um, it is something that they can, you know, get set up as a separate plan if they want. Custodial care, routine dental care, as I said, it's important to remember they don't cover that, you know, uh, dental care unless it's an injury um, to the mouth. Dentures, eye exams, um, foot care, cosmetic surgery, hearing aids. Now this is a complete rule of thumb. As I said, there are certain words that you can say and that you cannot say with Medicare. Um, you know, as I said, you can't say free. You have to say little to no cost. So just remember, do not speak in absolutes or over promise what's covered, what's not covered. Um, if it's medically necessary, it's probably covered, but may require prior authorization. So you gotta be careful. Individuals have, you know, for enrollment, they have essentially seven months. So they have that um, three months prior to turning 65, the month they turn 65, and three months after turning 65. So once enrolled, individuals have the option to change the plan um, annually if they choose to. So you know, definitely they have that seven months and then they can also, you know, if it doesn't fit their needs, they don't like having the plan B, they can definitely change their, uh, you know, the plan type that they want. Um, some of the commonly used Advantage plans, um, there's honestly, I want to say about six or so different plans. Um, HMO plans, Medicare HMO plans. Most of you are fairly familiar with HMO plans, especially if you've been selling any um, under 65 major medical plans. HMO you know, members must generally get health care from providers in the plan network. Um, you have a pre preferred provider plan, your PPO's plans, uh, similar to HMO plans, but you know, those members can see any doctor um, and provider that accepts Medicare. I believe there's about 82% right now of doctors that will accept Medicare. So um, random statistic that I had seen somewhere. I apologize. I can't remember precisely where it was. You have your Medicare special needs plans. Um, those are, you know, limit all or most of their memberships to people in some long-term care facilities like nursing homes um, who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid um, or who have certain chronic or disability um, conditions. Special needs are available in limited areas, so kind of keep that in mind. Not usually as common um, you know, plans used are your private fee-for-service plans. Um, they usually do cost more if they have a um, fee-for-service plan. Their premiums usually are higher. And then Medicare um, 
medical saving plans uh, have two parts to them. One part is Medicare Advantage plan with a high deductible, and one part is a medical savings account. So similar to if you were to sell a major medical plan under 65, you know, and they have a high deductible, a lot of times it will have that um, health savings account that is tacked onto it. So pretty similar in that regard, but not as commonly used. So I looked up some different statistics to see um, what plan types are most you know, commonly used and when and where and whatnot. So about two, thir two out of three, about 63% Medicare Advantage enrollees are in HMOs in 2017. One third of enrollees are in PPO plans. So your most common plans that you're going to probably be selling and that you should really be familiar with, if you are appointed with carriers, is you know if they have those HMO plans, definitely make sure that you study up on them. You know about those plans. You know about their benefits. Um, and then the remainder of those you know are for your private fee for service plans or your medical savings accounts. Um, but definitely over the years, the HMO plans have tremendously grown, um, you know, kind of taking a look at that 2007 to 2017, uh, 10 years, it looks like honestly almost 10% uh, growth. Additional coverage um, that your clients, you know, definitely could have in there. You have your group plans, you have retiree benefit plans, COBRA, um, you definitely want to make sure that you know the, the rules with those. Um, TRICARE for life. Um, most people know what TRICARE is. TRICARE is for your uh, military, uh, police. You have Medicaid. You have Medicaid and TRICARE. They never pay first for Medicare covered services. So for TRICARE for life, they must have Part B to keep um, TRICARE coverage. So that's like a must with TRICARE. Definitely make note of that. Um, but, you know, you definitely want to make sure that they have some different, um, you know, what all their different additional coverages may be. When they have other coverage, a lot of times Medicare then will take secondary to that covered um, benefit cost. So you kind of look at it as a secondary insurance for that customer. So if they're on a group plan, that group plan is going to pay uh, towards the services first, and then Medicare will pay second. So that's where some of these different um, items may come into play for your customer. You need part A and B to get part C and D. So if that makes sense to you, I'll give you a little bit of overview of why. So you have enrolling in original Medicare. Um, you have part A and part B. You have, you know, if you add the two of them together, you know, you have hospital coverage and then you have the um, outpatient doctor coverage and outpatient visits. Okay. And then step two, select that you have two different pathways that that customer can take, you know, what's going to um, maybe fit their needs best. So original Medicare includes part A and part B. Um, they can choose to buy a Medigap plan. Um, but they must have Part A and B first in order to do that. Part D from the Medi uh, Medicare prescription drug plans, uh, to buy a, a PDP, you have to have Part A only, uh, Part B only, or both. <laughs> Gets a little confusing in there. And then Part C, like a HMO or PPO, cover Part A and B services and supplies. So Part C is almost like having that combined Part A and B um, is the best way to look at it. So if they have that Part C where, you know, they choose that plan that essentially combines A and B together instead of having two separate plans, um, you know, there's the additional benefits and most plans cover prescription drugs. Okay. And to keep original Medicare and add a supplement, they can um, only have A and B and or Part D. So, you know, have to kind of look at that. If they want to have a Medigap plan, you have to see if they have A and B. Part C, they do not get to have that Medigap plan with it. And then just kind of looking at it, um, you know, with enrolling in Medicare, some of the different options and different things that they have. Um, turning 65 and receiving Social Security, SSA, or railroad retirement benefits automatically enrolls into Part A and B. 
receives that initial enrollment period package three months prior. As I said, they'll get that package. I don't know if you guys have ever um, worked with anybody who's been over 65 or approaching 65, I should say, um, or have any family members or friends, but they will get completely inundated with a whole bunch of mail um, prior to turning a 65 that is going to just tell them all about what Medicare is, um, the plans and the options that they have available. Um, and a lot of times it gets overwhelming because they really, really get <laughs> almost too much information. Under 65 am receiving Social Security disability income. They have to have that for 25 uh, months. So if they, you know, um, are on that 23rd, 24th month, you know, they're going to start receiving um, the package of information about, you know, Medicare. Um, under 65, you know. Um, with SSI, you know, they do qualify. But as I said, always remember that 25th month of disability benefits. Uh, turning 65 and not signing up for Social Security in, you know, income. So if they're just turning 65, they can contact their Social Security office three months prior to their birth date and let them know that they're turning 65 if they haven't already been contacted. Um, you can work with them on that um, if they, you know, if they need some assistance. They can, you know, visit their local social security office or contact them with a number. Um, you know, if they need uh, information for that plan enrollment, Medicare claim number, effective dates for Part A and B. Railroad and retirees should contact RRB, the Railroad Retirement Benefits um, Office, and they'll be able to assist those railroad retirees. So additional um, sources of information for you, your client, Medicare beneficiaries, and those interested in learning about Medicare. I do not recommend ever sending your clients to Medi the www.medicare.gov. They are there to enroll people in Medicare. If that's the case, then you're going to lose your Medicare sale. But it's a great source for you to find additional information. It's a uh, huge amount of uh, information in regards to Medicare. Um, you can do all sorts of searching in there. Maybe you want to do some specified searches about the Medicare Plan B or Medicare Plan A. Um, definitely, um, you know, can give you additional information in there. And when you're in doubt, if you have any questions, you can also use them as a source um, to help you out. So that way you're not giving incorrect information. Um, but definitely, I would not appoint your, you know, have your beneficiaries or your customers um, go to that website because they will help them out and get them enrolled. CMS.gov. Um, CMS, as I said, it does regulate Medicare, so they are a wealth of knowledge as well. So definitely you can go check that uh, website out, www.cms.gov. And then the Social Security Administration, um, low income subsidies, extra help. So if you have a customer who has low income and they need some additional help to pay for their prescriptions, um, maybe some of their, you know, uh, different things, then definitely you can reach out to um, the ssa.gov slash prescription help. I want to thank everyone definitely for hanging in there, joining us. Um, I definitely know that, you know, Medicare it definitely can be one of those things where it's a little bit gruesome. It's not exciting. It's not fabulous. But in order to sell it, you have to know it. So that's why we're kind of going through some of the basics of um, Medicare ABCs. So that way people can, you know, definitely understand so they can get out there and they can start hitting that huge, huge population that's joining. If you do have any questions, you can email training at ahcpsales.com. And I've already had a couple questions of people asking for the presentation. I definitely can get that sent out to you. Um, send me your email address that I can send it to um, and I'll PDF format and send it over to you guys. Um, so if you want a copy of the presentation, let me know. Um, you can or send an email to training at ahcpsales.com and uh, let me know that you'd like a copy. We also do uh, recordings, so this will also be available at a later time on uh, AHCP Sales website where you can view it. 
But I definitely want to tell everybody, thank you again for joining. I do appreciate your time. I know, you know, time away from sales is definitely, you know, can be cost costly, but I really do hope that this has been educational for you and that you've gotten some benefit out of the information. Um, I hope everybody has a fantastic day and I look forward to hopefully seeing everybody on next week's webinar when we cover uh, some additional information on Medicare. Thank you so much and have a great day.